All right. Good afternoon. Happy Valentine's almost. It's tomorrow, just as a tip off, in case that's important. Welcome to What Matters to Me and Why at UCI. I'm Kevin Bostenmeyer, a public affairs host on KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine, and also a member of the organizing committee for What Matters to Me and Why. It's my honor and privilege to be the program announcer today. First, a few event announcements. Our event is being filmed, so just by entering the room, you've agreed to be on film. But if you don't want to be, just move to the back behind the camera viewing area so that you won't be filmed. Also, for Q&A at the end of the program, please raise your hand so we can get you a microphone so we can hear you. And now about our wonderful program, What Matters to Me and Why. Every four weeks or so, we get the opportunity to hear from a UCI leader about what makes them tick, what gets them out of bed in the morning, and what lights their fire to overcome life's hurdles and embrace life's challenges. It's human, it's fun and funny, and it's inspiring. It's my experience that every talk is remarkably different in detail, but remarkably alike in spirit. If you're new to our speaker series, we welcome you and we I think you'll enjoy it. If you're returning for the first time or after many times, we are glad you're here and thrilled that you are finding value. To all of you, our organizing committee hopes that we will contribute to your passion in the work that you do here at UCI. Zot, zot, zots. <laughs> Today's speaker is Professor Judy Yu who is the chair of the Asian American Studies Department. She's a delight. Next month, on March 13th, our speaker will be Andrea Gutierrez, UCI's Basic Needs Coordinator. And now, as is our tradition, before each speaker, we invite you to take a minute to introduce yourself to your armchair neighbor to make a friend. And after that, physics professor Claire Yu will introduce Professor Wu. All right, so moving right along, um, it is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Wu to the What Matters to Me and Why. Um, Judy Wu is a professor and chair of the Department of Asian American Studies uh, here at UCI. She was born in Taiwan, immigrated to the US when she was six and grew up in Spokane, Washington. She went to Stanford for her undergraduate and graduate uh, degrees, and after she received her PhD in U.S. history at Stanford, she then joined the faculty at Ohio State University, where she taught for 17 years. Her research and teaching focus on analyzing intersecting social hierarchies, such as those based on race, gender, sexuality, and citizenship, and she explores how individuals form identities and navigate uh, or protest and or protest social inequalities. She's authored a number of books, including Dr. Mom Chung of the Fair-Haired Bastards, The Life of a Wartime Celebrity, and Radicals on the Road, Internationalism, Orientalism, and Feminism During the Vietnam Era. Um, she's currently working on another book project in collaboration with Gwendolyn Mink, um, exploring the political career of Patsy Takamoto Link, the first woman of color U.S. congressional representative and co-sponsor of Title IX, which I'm sure we're going to hear more about. Um, she's also working on a book uh, that focuses on Asian American and Pacific Islander women, um, as well as a number of other projects. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wu. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I wasn't sure who would show up, and it seems like it would be kind of embarrassing to talk about your innermost meaning <laughs> feelings and the commitments of your life, and no one came. So <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to be sharing some of my work, um, both um, the ideas that have and values that have shaped me, but I'm also going to be sharing some creative work with you. A few years back, I learned how to create digital narratives. So these are forms of storytelling that involve music and visuals. And so I'll be sharing a few of those with you as well. 
So when I met with Claire and Kevin, they really emphasized, tell us like what makes you tick, like what motivates you. And I think this theme of searching for home and belonging is something that really resonates for me and I think resonates for a number of people on this campus. And it really has to do with coming here as an immigrant. I came here when I was six. My parents had also previously relocated. They were from mainland China. They left in the 40s to go to Taiwan, so they were also transplants. And in the 70s, they transplanted once again to the United States. And like other immigrants, they experienced downward mobility, not necessarily upward mobility. Right? They were actually middle class professionals in Taiwan, but they were concerned about the economic opportunities long term for my family. And also, Taiwan at the time was under martial law, and so they were concerned about my brother having to man mandatorily go into the military. So when we came to the United States, they made a living the way they could. We ran a restaurant. We ran a hamburger restaurant <laughs> that also served Chinese food. And uh, <laughs> we also ran a convenience store. So I grew up, I'm a really good change maker. <laughs> um, I cleaned out the ice cream machine. That was really good. <laughs> um, and I spent holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, selling beer, selling butter, selling milk, all the things that people forget right, when they want to have a celebration. And that was my childhood. Um, and so I think that's something, again, a lot of immigrants experience, this pressure to survive economically. And oftentimes that means relying on each other, relying on your family to make ends meet. So being an outsider, being someone who came to the United States without knowing much English, I remember on the plane I was practicing saying, how are you? Right, that's how you greet people. Um, and going to my first day of school, and um, our elementary school was slotted to go to the library, which is in the trailer. And my parents had told me, you go to school, you come right back. And so when we left the school to go to the trailer, I remember fighting with my teachers, like, no, 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 I have to go home. <laughs> right? They couldn't communicate with me to explain what we were doing. So I learned English when I was in school. Right? All those experiences really reinforced in me the sense of being an outsider. And being an outsider, I was really interested in trying to discover well, how did other people navigate being outsiders? So I'm a teacher, and I'm interested in what you think of this image. This is the first Miss Chinatown beauty pageant that was held in 1925. It's actually connected to my first publication, which was about the beauty pageant, but in the 60s and 70s. What do you see in this image? How are these women displaying themselves? How are they conveying their sense of identity? I'm going to call on people when you don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> the dress. What do you notice about the dress? Well, they look very formal and they look uh, like they are related to some cultural connection. Okay, that they're formal, that they're perhaps Chinese dresses. Right, you see the kind of dragon and the blossom motif. Anybody else? Anything else about the dress? Are they wearing heels? And we get to see their ankles, <laughs> right? This is the 1920s. This is the period of the flappers. Right? And so you see the headband across the top. Right? These women are expressing that they are both Chinese and American. Right? Um, somebody who really helped me think about what it means to be hybrid, right? to take elements of one culture and another and blend it together, is Maxine Hong Kingston. And I think many of you might know of her work, and I, if you haven't, I encourage you to explore her work. But she happened to be coming through Spokane, Washington, giving a reading about her writings. And I love this quote. Chinese Americans, when you try to understand what things in you are Chinese, how do you separate what is peculiar to childhood, to poverty, insanities, one family, your mother who marked your growing up with stories, from what's Chinese? What is Chinese tradition? and what is in the movies. Right? Really thinking about the various influences that shape our understanding of what difference is, or belonging is, or culture is. And that, in some ways, this frees me to think about multiple ways in which being Chinese and being American can be reinterpreted and blended together. I remember when I talked to her, I had this really convoluted question about, my parents want me to speak Chinese at home, they want me to be Chinese, but I want to be American because I go to school. And she said, well, why can't you be both? Why can't you be Chinese American? And that was like a huge weight that lifted off of me. And I think that's something that we try to explore within Asian American study as a field. What does it mean to come from a part of the world that seems so geographically remote, perhaps culturally remote, 
closely marginalize with the United States, and how do we bring those things together? So I explore this theme about how do you belong, how do you create hybrids, and that really inspired my first book. It was about a woman named Margaret Chung. She was the first American-born Chinese female doctor. And to introduce her to you, I'm going to just show you a short video about her life. I didn't expect to find someone like Margaret Chung in Asian American history. It's a fact it is that we women folk are beating all you men. You get evidence of it every day. She was a physician, a pioneer who crossed racial and gender boundaries to become the first Chinese American woman doctor. She publicly dressed like a man. Aren't women wonderful? Aren't women grand? And she privately expressed longing, stole kisses, and occasionally shared a bed with other women. She never married and chose not to have children, at least not biologically. Instead, she adopted nearly 1,000 offspring, mostly American pilots, who shared her love for the United States and China. I'm the last of the red hot mama. They've all cooled down but me. Flap of them, say what do they know? Come get your hot stuff from this volcano. As well as her hatred for Japan. Now it may be snowing. But when I get going, oh baby, I'm hungry. You can During World War II, she was a celebrity who socialized with actors, politicians, military leaders, opera stars, and cabaret singers. She was Mom Chung, and they were her fair-haired bastards. She was traditional, yet transgressive asexual, yet queer, maternal, yet masculine, exotically different, yet iconically American. How might it have felt to be so different, to want to fit in against near impossible odds? And yet, to want to change the world, so that it might not be so painful to be oneself. Diary entry. Shoved off and caught on Long Chung at 0930. Found her in good spirits, but looked very bad. She said that she has five months to live, but she's not perturbed by it. September 26, 1958. This closes a very delightful and inspiring chapter in our lives. God bless and rest her very beautiful soul. There will never be another mom child. January 1959. Diary Entries of Adopted Son and Vice Admiral Charles Lockwood.
So as you can tell, I'm interested in really interesting, problematic people whose values I agree with and I disagree with. Um, but I'm interested in the choices that they make about when they have to challenge so many different types of barriers. When they have to challenge racial barriers, gender and sexual barriers, class barriers. This is one of my most favorite images that I found in Margaret Chung. And it just gives you the sense of isolation that she might have felt. Right? She's the only woman, she's the only person who's not white of her medical school. And she's right in the middle. Um, and she both blends in and she doesn't. She's adopting male clothing, right, like the other guys. And she liked hanging out with guys. She liked gambling. She liked swearing. <laughs> she liked camping. Um, but she was always different. And she was someone who really strategically used her difference. Um, sometimes it was imposed on her. So the real hero's um, comic book, she never wore Chinese clothing. But they drew her in Chinese clothing. So you like really understand I hope that's not my phone, <laughs> that she's Chinese. They even do the bamboo lettering, <laughs> right? Um, so this is a great quote that I found. This is her, I think, medical advisor when she was an intern and, and a resident. She never wore Chinese clothes, but on all occasions appeared in a thin black tailored suit, a white silk shirt waist, and went on the street a black sailor hat. This costume would have been very inconspicuous had she not always carried a short sport cane. And I love that last detail. Because she wasn't just trying to blend in, she was also showing off a little bit. She loved sports cars. <laughs> right? People in Chinatown would talk about the young men in, this, in the neighborhood, like, oh, she drives this type of car. Right? And so there's something that, to her that's ostentatious, um, that she's trying to break multiple barriers, um, but she's using the tools that she has at her disposal. So that's definitely one of the main themes that I think drives me, the sense of being an outsider and trying to find, a, find, trying to find belonging. I think the other main thing that defines me and that I often trace my origin as a, as a person is becoming an activist. So I'm going to share with you um, why I am the way I am or the type of work that I do. And again, I want to show you a short narrative about my activism as a student at Stanford University. Twenty years ago, I was arrested. It was not exactly what my parents had in mind when they sent me to college. We had immigrated from Taiwan when I was six. In this land of freedom and opportunity, my parents worked long, grueling hours and endured cruel comments about their strange accents and slanted eyes. All this for the hope that my brother and I might find a better life here. In college, instead of majoring in pre-med, I took over the president's office. It began with a flyer, an act of hate speech, followed by racial terrorism. I was outraged, but more importantly, I wanted to make a difference create a better world, one in which divides across race and culture might be understood and bridged. I joined with other students, white, black, Chicano, American Indian, Asian American. We called for more ethnic studies we wanted professors and classes so that we could learn about each other's histories and cultures. We called for a more diverse student body and adequately supported ethnic student centers where we could find a comfortable couch, a friendly face, familiar and unfamiliar foods, places where we could create a sense of home and community. We believed in the democratic promise of America and wanted an education for the future. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing Let it be.
protest was not the first step. It was the last solution after countless meetings, petitions, and excuses. When the time came, we all had a choice. Should I leave the president's office and avoid arrest? Or should I stay with my friends and comrades, all of us varying colors of the rainbow? We applauded those who left and began to sing. The police had to release us. There were hundreds of students surrounding the bus, there to support us, refusing to move. My parents found out. They read about the takeover in a Chinese newspaper. They told me, next time, make sure they know your Chinese name. Nosotros venceremos. We shall overcome. The next year, I served on a search committee that hired the first two Asian American Studies professors for Stanford. University officials denied any connection to the takeover, but we know better. I think I just restarted the presentation from the beginning. <laughs> um, I wanted to share that with you because I said that this is really my, my origin as a person. Um, what precipitated the protests is that there's an African American theme dorm at Stanford. And there are theme dorms for other communities as well. But it was a chance for anybody who was living there and people who were interested in attending events there to learn about black history and culture. But there were some students on campus who didn't think that it should exist. So they scrawled the N-word on flyers. They drew these bug out characters of what they thought black people looked like. And even though I didn't live there, I just thought it was wrong. Right? This is where we're supposed to come, college, to learn about things that we haven't been exposed to before, to become future leaders. And that this is not something that should take place on, on college campuses. So I joined with other students, not to just condemn the students who did that work, but to think about a more positive vision. Right? What are we learning in our classes? Are there support services that are necessary for students who feel like they're outsiders, who need to find a place within universities? Um, and that experience of talking to faculty members, talking to administrators, and always getting the roadblocks, <laughs> saying that's important, but we can't prioritize that right now, really led me to think about well, what are some creative ways that we can create change within the academy? And that also led me to my research project, which was my second book. I was interested in the multiracial activists, men and women, who crossed national borders during the Vietnam War, who connect with the people who are considered the enemies of their nations, and try to find a sense of political commonality. So these are just some of the, the stories that are in that particular book. I look at Eldridge Cleaver, former Black Panther Party leader, his travels to Socialist Asia. He went to North Korea, North Vietnam, and 
the People's Republic of China in 1970. I look at a women's conference that was held in Canada that attracted women from throughout the United States, North America, as well as Southeast Asia, and the ways in which they're trying to talk to each other to try to promote peace. Um, and I also look at Robert Brown. He's pictured to your right with Martin Luther King and Thich Nhat Hanh. So I think many of you might have seen Thich Nhat Hanh's writings. If you go to Amazon, any store about Buddhism, he was the only Buddhist monk, Vietnamese Buddhist monk in the United States when monks in Vietnam started burning themselves in protest of President Diem. And he was friends with Robert Brown. And so they talked about how can they try to create, a, create an audience, create a platform for them to share what is happening in Vietnam and how to stop the violence. So these are just some of the things that I, that I do with my, my research. So I've talked about my personal background. I've talked about my background as an activist. And I want to shift into this last session thinking about what I do as a teacher. Um, and um, I really am proud of being a mentor. And I think one of the key moments for me was an oral history project that I helped coordinate at Ohio State University. We wanted to commemorate the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And Ohio, some people who ended up there who are Japanese Americans, they traced their history to internment because they were forced out of the West Coast, and some of them never went back. They went further inland. Um, we brought together 40-some students. We just advertised broadly and said, who's interested in doing this project? Um, there was a person on campus who was from the BBC and said, I have documentary filmmaking skills. I'm happy to teach your students. So out of that set of interviews, they, they talked to 10 people, and they created eight short documentary interviews about their lives. And one of the people is pictured here. Her name is Karen Jobu. I'm still Facebook friends with her. She's still an activist who's really involved in issues related to public health in the Asian American community. She helped start the you know, Columbus, Ohio Asian American Festival that's held every May. Um, this is when she was four. She went into internment camp when she was two. So her memories of that time period was really about the period afterwards when her family was trying to reestablish themselves economically. So she talked about how her father, in some ways, you know, face a lot of economic pressure. So sometimes he would engage in gambling. And sometimes all they would have to eat was a piece of white bread with a lot of sugar and cinnamon. It's a lot of calories, but it doesn't cost very much. Right? Um, but this is what she said about being able to engage in this project. And she connected a lot of our students with community members for them to do the research. 60 some years ago, my family and I were interned in Gila River, uh, Gila, Arizona, because we were Japanese American. I was born in Lodi, California. After World War II, I returned there to grow up hiding the fact that I was interned. Right? Can you imagine trying to hide who you are? Um, it was an unconscious act of embarrassment. I wanted to be like an all-American kid. Now that I'm older and have time to reflect, the possibility of putting my memories and album pictures together as a project <clears throat> that is going to help students record history is extremely exciting to me. I just want to say one other thing, which is this student, Jenna Duperstein, at the time she was a sophomore, undeclared. And she said, I want to develop the publicity for your, for your program. And I said, sure. And I expected her to do computer graphics. And she didn't know how to do computer graphics. But she had incredible portraiture skills. Her grandmother had Alzheimer's. And she would go visit her in um, nursing homes. And she would just draw the pictures of people that she saw in the nursing homes. So for everybody that we interviewed, we, she <laughs> drew a portrait of them when they were younger. So that's the title, Faces of the Past, Voices of the Present. And Jenna, after this project, said, well, I don't want to just have these eight little mini documentaries. I want to try to put it all together as a cohesive documentary. So she made a feature-length documentary. And last time I talked to her, she's working with NASA, doing documentary work for them. So I've been doing that type of work at UCI. And these are just some of the projects I'm really proud of. Um, badass. <laughs> uh, so it stands for the beginnings of activism for the Department of Asian American Studies. I came here as a newcomer four years ago. I heard we were having a 25th anniversary celebration. I said, OK, let's go for it. Um, but I didn't know that much about the history. But the history that I was engaged in at Stanford in the late 80s is a similar to a type of history that occurred here in the early 90s. There were about 40-some percent students of Asian American background here, but they only had access to two classes that could reflect and help them think about their histories, their cultures, their identities. Um, and even though they had a lot of discussion and debate, it really came down to student protest. Um, at the time, in order to register for classes, you had to turn in a paper slip. 
So they would go to the registrar's office and turn in paper slips of non-existent Asian American Studies classes. <laughs> um, they engaged in a hunger strike. They took over Aldrich Hall. Right? It's that type of same passion that led to the creation of our department. And our students help record that, that history and preserve that history. Um, this is a group. I know there's some people who are involved in this group who are here. Cephaline, is she here? Yay! <laughs> so Cephaline's picture here. Um, 1977, there was a national women's conference that was held in Houston, and about 20,000 people attended. And it was the first time the federal government funded something like this that would develop a national women's agenda. I went to an NEH summer institute, and I came back thinking, well, who were the Asian American and Pacific Islander women who went? So we came back. There was a group of students who were interested in doing research, including a student from Santa Barbara at that time who was just finishing her first year. But she was looking for something to do over the summer. And they combed through the, the delegates list, try to identify as many people as possible. They started conducting interviews. And one of the people that we discovered is Mitsui Yamada, who is a renowned Japanese American poet and writer. And the students were so thrilled to meet her. They read her work in our classes, and now they have a chance to actually meet her. Um, and then um, lastly, and definitely not leastly, <laughs> um, Bo Darafont. He came into my office and said, I want to do research. I said, fine, that's great. What are we going to do? It took him a while to figure it out. But he decided he was going to do interviews with Asian American and Pacific Islanders who are undocumented and try to record their experiences. He is an artist and a poet. And we figured out a way to really show a format that would really showcase his work. Um, we decided to create these tarot cards. This is inspired by a deck that focuses on Asian American mental health. For his tarot card set, he has artwork on one side, and on the back are either quotes or poetry that he's written about being undocumented. So these are our UCI students. And I love that process of helping students transition from being students in the classroom, where they're absorbing information, to becoming scholars and activists who have their own voice and have their own passion. So I'm going to just end. <laughs> Let's see, how much time do I have? Am I? OK, all right. So maybe I'll just, well, anyway, we'll see. Um, last year, I had the privilege of speaking at um, Andaki graduation. And it was just such an incredible, moving experience. Um, these students have gone through enormous challenges to be able to go to college and to finish college. Um, and their families were there. Um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. But I shared two of my favorite books <laughs> with the students in the audience and the families in the audience. And one of them is Charlotte's Web. How many people read Charlotte's Web? <laughs> right. So one thing I really love about this book is that it's about a group of outsiders. right? Um, it's about a spider who can spell, <laughs> um, a pig who's just really lovable, right? um, or a little girl who wants to save somebody who doesn't, is not supposed to be saved. And they form, come together, and they create a community. Um, and even the worst, right, Templeton the Rat, <laughs> right, he has a role to play in building that community. Similar things about Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands. I read this when I was in college, and it was incredibly empowering. For those of you who have not had a chance to explore it, it's both in English and in Spanish. And growing up in a bilingual household, to be able to see that in print was incredibly empowering, even if I don't read Spanish. <laughs> but to be able to understand that that is acceptable, that that is something that's legitimate. And um, she talks about how when you're from the borders, it's a space of danger, or at least other people see it as a space of danger. Borders are set up. I can't even see my own computer. <laughs> borders are set up to find the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from, from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is a constant state of transition, though prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. I think these words are really important now as we think about the ways in which um, some people are concerned about reinforcing borders. That is a geographical, political boundary, um, but it also is a deeply cultural one, one filled with emotional anxiety and fear. And instead of accepting that paradigm of the borders as being places of danger, She's embracing it and saying, we are mestiza, we are hybrid, we are of multiple cultures, and that we need to embrace 
those moments, those margins, as the place of, of creation, a place of creativity, um, a place for dialogue. And so she's asking us, right, to survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras. You must live without borders and embrace being a crossroads. I think those words are so important for us today. So I'm going to just conclude with some final thoughts. Um, I want to thank my husband, who's in the middle of the audience. <laughs> I understand none of his colleagues are here. They wanted to get some inside scoop about how he, what he thinks and how he functions. Um, but I could not do the work that I do without his support. He gets up every morning, gets our kids up, prepares their lunches. I just sort of do email <laughs> during that time. Um, but he's an incredibly supportive partner and father. Um, we recently, this is a picture in Germany, which is where my husband's family is from. And also a picture of, of San Jose, Costa Rica, where we just celebrated our 50th birthdays together. <laughs> um, and I love those wings, which you can also see in Santa Ana and other cities. Um, it's a work of art that's connected to Mexico. Right? To think about these, these geographical sites as all being somehow connected to each other, and that you can experience some sort of um, artistic, cultural connection across borders. And as you think about these kind of last lines, right, living without borders, creating new forms of belonging, inspiring new generations of teachers and storytellers, I thought I would just end with a final clip. This is not my clip. This is a, a film that was being made about Patsy Takamoto Mink called Ahead of the Majority. So I just want to end by saying something about that title, Ahead of the Majority. That is a phrase that she used when she was running for office in 1976 for the Senate. She didn't win. But she was saying that it's easy to go along with the majority. But it is so much more important and um, necessary to be ahead, right? to stake what you think is ethically right, and to bring other people to that position. So um, thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope that we can all be ahead of the majority. <laughs> Are there any questions? Just raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. Comments, accolades. <laughs> Anything your husband might have always wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm kind of wondering what your it's okay. I don't know that. <laughs> we need it. I'm right next to it. It's all good. No. Judy, I'm wondering, um, comparing some of what your college experience is at Stanford, where there's a lot of coalition building uh, among different ethnic groups, what it is that you might, how you might compare the generational differences between today's students and how it was for you. And I'm also, it, it's a different question, but maybe similar how uh, the regional difference of being at Ohio State and the makeup of the University of Ohio State differs from your experience here at UCI? Thank you, those are really great questions. I think when we look back in history and see moments of coalition, there's a tendency to idealize it. So those coalitional relationships were hard to build and they were the product of multiple generations of students and mentors fostering that type of relationship. Um, but it was an incredible moment because those students had worked, before I even entered the scene, they had been working on trying to divest from South Africa. They had been trying to gain redress and reparations for Japanese Americans. Right? So they had been sharing struggles that might seem very specific to a particular community, but communicating with each other and saying, this is something that we should all support. Um, and it was not seamless. So there were still many meetings, pre-meetings, post-meetings, <laughs> right, deliberating on all these different strategies. And I think um, coming to UCI, it's, it's very different from Ohio State. There's definitely a much more diverse student body. Um, but Ohio State was also an institution that tended to attract first generation students. And for some of those students, they were coming from rural or suburban Ohio. And so being at OSU in Columbus, it was like the most diverse place that they had ever been but not very diverse compared to California, <laughs> right? And so students there still had to learn, right, 
how do you how do you talk to people of different backgrounds? How do you understand each other's histories and struggles? And I think that's similar to here as well. Um, in some ways, because there's such large populations of some communities, definitely not all of them, um, that it can be easier right, to form communities just within your own group, however you want to define it. And it, it takes effort, and it takes a lot of communication and dialogue to foster those relationships of trust. Hi, Judy. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, I just had a question that you know, in all the years of activism and leadership that have been part of your life, how do you deal with or cope with the really, really um, painful and traumatic things that you come across or have experienced? I eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when I go home, my husband will tell you, <laughs> um, I also try to exercise. <laughs> um, I think forming communities really help. And sometimes people are not interested right, in kind of connecting, um, building bridges, and other people are. And so I think I try to search out for those opportunities. Um, right? If there's a roadblock, is there a way around it? <laughs> right? Is there a way under it? Is there a way over it? Um, and I think to try to kind of keep in mind what's the, what, you know, why, why are we doing this? Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of painful moments. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for talking to us. I really love the digital narratives. And I. <laughs> and uh, one item you s highlighted about um, your parents reading about your activism in the newspaper, I just wasn't sure is that because they highlighted to have your Chinese name? Is that because if you're going to stand up, you should stand up loud and proud? Or so that it was misquoted, your name was misquoted in the Chinese newspaper? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I was not going to tell my parents, like being a good student, right? <laughs> um, and I didn't think they would find out. Um, so I was surprised when they called me and said, we heard about this protest, and we think you were in it. Uh, but I think they were saying, we are proud of you for doing this. My, um, my cousin, every time we get together, he likes to say, she's the only person in the family got arrested. <laughs> um, but they had gone through this life of being in the United States, of being discriminated against, of you know, the frustrations to not be able to communicate what they want to communicate because of language barriers. And so I think they got what I was trying to do. Um, and so that is something I think that they are proud of me and that, that if I'm going to be in the newspaper, they would like to see that they're, you know, the Chinese-ness of who I am is recognized. Hi, Judy. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. My, my question is, um, in your analysis of kind of your family background, did your parents, were they very vocal to you and kind of talking to you about, you know, why they initially moved from you know, China to, to Taiwan, then to Taiwan to the United States? And, or did you kind of do a lot of digging on your own to come across those conclusions? And also, I'm curious to know if you also share your background with your own children to kind of uh, make sure the history kind of passes down? <laughs> Those are great questions. Um, I, you know, there's a gender divide in terms of communication in my family. So my mother is much more willing to talk, right, and kind of share what she's experienced. Then my dad is much more distant. And also, even though I speak Chinese, I, I feel like I speak Chinese as a, a kid. So in some ways, it's hard to have some of those communications. But my dad's pretty, um, he's, he's late, in his late 80s right now, and he's been going through dialysis. So he really feels like he's on his last leg. Um, and just this last time when I went to visit him, he wanted to tell us something about his family back in China. So he left when he was a teenager and didn't go back for decades because US and China didn't have political relationships. Right? And then also, we were struggling to get by financially, so it was hard for him to go back. So he didn't go back for decades. And he wanted to say, I want to say this to my, my brothers and sisters. And I was trying to think, well, how am I going to? how am I going to do this, right? Like, my Chinese is not good enough. And so we're like, let's record it on the iPhone, <laughs> right? Um, so that way he can at least, you know, say his goodbyes. And it's in his voice and it's in his words and that hopefully it will be easy to transmit back to his family. But I learned some things during that recording that I didn't know as well. Um, so I think those intergenerational dialogues, it's something that we really want to encourage our students to have. But it's also sometimes very difficult to do, right? Um, Sometimes the parents don't want to share everything that they've survived 
for their children. And sometimes it's hard, either linguistically or culturally, to do that type of work. Um, I don't know with my kids. <laughs> I think they're mostly giving us demands like, you know, get me this milk. <laughs> like, um, I want lunch. <laughs> so I don't know if they're interested and curious about us as people. <laughs> Hi, Judy. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I know we do a lot of work together. And then one thing I, I just can't be, I just don't know how you can always keep a smile. <laughs> you always have that great smile that it's like everything you can handle it. So I really, really appreciate that positive um, vibe always coming from you. Um, we share some history, I mean, some similarity, because my parents also went to Taiwan from mainland China in 1949, and then I grew up in Taiwan. I didn't move here until I was in my 20s. But I have a question that is, you know, we always, when we do this kind of activism, we always get frustrated. It seems that, I mean, I always get frustrated. You seem like you, you keep going, right? Um, it seems to me it's like every 20 years or so, like things just say repeat itself it's as if there's no progress. Um, because you were talking about you were in uh, Stanford in the 80s, right? I was at Stanford as a postdoc in 2000, 2001. I was in the theater department. So when I was there, I taught the first class of Asian American theater. Wow. I have four students, all right? And then we students came to me and said, we need to revive Asian American theater the group that David Henry Huang started in 1970s. So they haven't been doing that. So I revived it, I directed the play and, and, and things like that. So that was almost like 20 years after you were at Stanford. And then, and then as you know, I just created theater walks of like the second decades of the, <laughs> of the 21st century. That's like another 20 years. It, it seems that we keep going back to the beginning that we're doing something new because it, no one has done it before. But we have done it before. But how do we regress to the point that we are doing the first one? We're doing the first one. Yeah. So I just don't know how you keep going because we keep seeing that in history, right? Because when I did the theater group, I was like, this should be like, has, has, it, this has been done in the 70s or in the 60s. But now we're doing that again in 21st century. Yeah, so yeah, no, your that's, that's, that's a really good question. What I was doing, uh, when we were doing the research about the AAPI women who went to the National Women's Conference, I remember when the students said, wow, the issues that were discussed in the 70s are almost exactly like the issues now, mm -hmm. right? Poverty, health insurance, mm -hmm. right? All these different issues. Um, and so one way to look at that is that we have not progressed, <laughs> right? Um, and I think it does say something about the resilience of resistance mm -hmm. right, against change. Um, but another way you might think about it is that there have been generations of people who have continued to try to do the right thing, <laughs> right? To make our society more inclusive, to advocate for social justice. And each time I see an example of that, it just gives me a boost. When I went to the, 19, the reunion conference, the 2017 reunion conference, 40 year reunion conference in 1977, the same issue came up. And this woman said, I was here in 1977 and I'm here today with my granddaughter. Right, like multi generations of, of women who have been active, and I feel like we're in a great position as as educators, right, to see the, the generations of students who come through, and each one of them will go on and make a difference. Um, I know it, Theater Box is such an amazing group, but also think like, okay, well, East West Players, right, right was founded, and now there's um, mentors in the community who can come and sh and help um, inspire our students here, and so I think that there there is change. It's small, it's incremental, and there's going to be backlash. But um, I think the alternative is not to do anything. Right. And that's really unacceptable, I think, for many of us. Thanks. Hi, Judy. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, when you started off with the concepts of hybrid and or intersectionality as opposed to community, and that first example got me thinking, um, how do you find community when you have these different intersections in your life that you're trying to adopt, but none of the communities that you find may be holistically encompassing? So how, do you, how does some of the people that you've studied reconcile this idea that they, they fall between different cultures or different worlds, 
and none of those seems to be the home. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I do talk about the importance of community and collaboration, but community and co communities are also fraught, mm -hmm. right? Because there's also ways in which they might discipline you or surveil you, and right that you have to live up to that example of being in the community. So one example is Margaret Chung. Um, so people didn't talk about her sexuality, but there were always rumors. And when I finished the book, a filmmaker actually said, I'm interested in doing a documentary about her, but would it be OK if I didn't talk about her sexuality? And I was like, no. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, this is, a, this is part of who she is. Um, it's part of her, her life. It's how people perceived her. It's how she navigated multiple barriers. So why would you cut that out if you just wanted a sanitized version right, of her, her life? And so I think it's always really important to think about the ways in which we do have multiple dimensions of our identity. And that sometimes the collective can monitor and censor that. Um, but I think increasingly there's more and more interest in fostering those type of intersectional conversations and cross-border conversations. Um, I just see some people here from the Cross-Cultural Center, and I know they're at the forefront of doing that type of work. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's just recognizing that this is how people form identity, and also the ways in which people can also police one another as well. Thank you, Professor Wu. Thank you, everybody, for coming. If we could please give her a nice round of applause. <laughs>